Dodemark started off in 1991, you know, just with myself, out of the back, you know, bedroom. Uh, and then eventually, you know, we, we grew organically, increasing staff numbers. And sort of like throughout the early 2000s, you know, we had quite stable numbers in terms of staff, you know, six people, something like that. But getting a really nice, you know, breadth of different types of work. You know, we, we did Mini, we did BMW, for example, or TUI. Uh, we also worked with Aircom in Ireland, you know, to creating custom typefaces and breadth of logos. And then, of course, about four or five years ago, uh, Nokia hit, you know, and it hit big time. To the point that within two years, you know, we, we more or less tenfolded, nearly tenfolded our staff levels, you know. And we are now just around 50 people altogether. So, so, so the last four or five years have been pretty dramatic in terms of like company history. I mean, for one, we've done incredibly great work what with the Nokia project, which is pretty unique in, in that sense. And now others are following, you know, I mean, we have done, have since we have done work with Intel, we've done work with HP, all of them kind of like multilingual on a global level. But you can also now follow that Google has started to invest into um, a multilingual typeface. So, so the whole thing has sort of like something, set something in motion. But you know that it had the Nokia project and then subsequent work has meant you know that we have really grown into a leading studio for typeface design. No, not only custom, but now also increasingly our own library work. Type defines the tone of voice of a brand um, by its emotional qualities. Now it's very difficult to actually measure those emotional qualities. But through cultural uh, conditioning, if you wish, we can now say, OK, a grotesque typeface, you know, such as a universe aerial Helvetica, feels more masculine, more mechanical, more engineered, and a bit colder and less approachable than, say, a frutica, you know, which is a humanist sans serif, so with this open, warm, friendly, approachable tones. Uh, the a serif typeface may maybe ha may have the appearance of being old fashioned or bookish. So that way you can sort of like steer the tone of voice. You know, you can shout or you can be quiet and so on and so forth. And I think say, I can't measure it. You know, I can't tell you if you use tell this typeface, this is going to happen. But I can say from experience, if you use this typeface, you will achieve this kind of tone of voice from experience and it, but it's, it's obviously very much dependent on cultural conditioning what i can tell you however the more practical elements is that if you use this typeface your legibility suffers if you use this typeface you have a better legibility now legibility may not always be an issue but i can pretty much tell you which one reads faster which one doesn't read as fast and because because there is there is uh, tests available for that, there is research available for that, that already make those predictions fairly clearly. So I can tell you what's happening in your brain, uh, depending on the typeface that you're using. Thoughtful and intelligent design is, is it's, it, in my opinion, is design that has a solution in mind. It's, it's not self-serving, it's not about art, it's, it's, it's about addressing a need. And that's what design is intrinsically, you know, we, 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 we create solutions as designers, whether you're an interior designer or whatever, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. And this is our approach to the work that we do in type as well. And when we work with graphic designers, you know, they, they're solving or our clients, which is usually design agencies, they, they are solving a certain part of a problem and we are solving a very specialist part of that problem. And, 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 uh, and now the way we work is very in, in very close collaboration with, with our design colleagues you know, and partners to make sure that everything fits seamlessly together. And that, that is important. You know, like, like all the characters have to fit seamlessly together, then the font has to fit in with the logo, with the colors, with generally the, 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 the visual language in general, you know, and that's, that's really what the ethos is, you know, and, and it's always that collaboration. I, you know, I don't believe that any one single person can create 
wonderful design. It's always a team. There's always a, a multitude of people who contribute. You know, yeah, someone, one individual may uh, drive an idea and may may push it forward. But I say it's always the collaboration. It's always the result of a lot of people. You know, that create good design at the end. Every single time. Every single time. It's, it's not because of custom typeface. It's, of course, um, it's big investment. And it is a big challenge to convince the client of the idea that they should have their own font. Uh, it's a big investment in terms of money and it's a big investment in terms of time. And a lot of times end clients are not typographically aware. You know, in the end of the day, they say, hey, you know, why would I buy, buy you know, a phone from you? I've, I've got Arial on my computer. It does everything I need to do. I've got Comic Sans. You know, it does everything I need to do. And then you have to start, like, really guiding them, you know, to the fact that, yeah, but the way you speak typographically is the way you dress, is the way to drive a car, is the way you communicate every single day. And you need to take that into account. But it's quite often those arguments are less impactful, say, than the financial and the logistic arguments. And, and that's when it comes down, when you tell the client, well, yeah, you may have Arial on every single computer, you know, but you may not have Arial on specialist machines, equipment that you use, if you want to use it there, uh, then you have to go and license it. And that will cost you a lot of money over a long time. You know? Uh, you may not have this, you may not have that, you may not have the language support, and so on and so forth. It's, it's really the finances and the logistics that, in the end, convince the client, particularly big corporates, of the return on investment on a custom typeface. Nothing in terms of scale and propor proportion will ever compare to Nokia. <laughs> uh, we, the Nokia project, well, you know, we worked on that we worked on the Nokia project for the best part of four years, always occupied, occupying a third to half of our studio resources, I'd say. Intel and HP, well, you know, substantial projects, never took that long, uh, each probably about a couple of years, you know, and each being handled by one team, so five, six, seven people you know, in that region. So it, nowhere near that kind of scale that Nokia project was and the kind of challenges we had. Of course, with the Nokia project, the challenges were that we, we were entering deep water we had never entered before. It's literally uncharted waters. You know, how, how do you design a Sinhala typeface when there's hardly anything around? How do you deal with Bengali? You know, how do you deal with this when you've never done it before and when there's very little um, documentation, how to build fonts, how to do them right? Not only... Not only um, uh, technically, that stuff is all documented, but linguistically, for example, it's, it's those challenges you're facing. But the Nokia project allowed us to build the systems, so every, work, every piece of work that followed, obviously we were able to deal with far more competently, far quicker, far more efficiently.